in a few seconds. Okay, welcome to pharma, pharma colleagues. <laughs> welcome to anatomy and physiology. We have lecture number seven, and today we will talk about two important topics: the cardiovascular system and the and the blood. Blood. What is blood? What, what is the component of the blood? Tell me how many people think the blood is just red blood cells, right? So blood is not just red blood cells. Blood is actually containing the red blood cells, but basically blood is much more than that. All right, so let's get the start. And the first part, we will talk about the heart. Where is the heart? There you are. Okay, so let's see. Yeah. All right, so what is the heart? The heart, the heart is, I will tell you, I'm going to give you some clinical considerations from the very, very, very beginning. Huh? So can you see my, my, my envelope here, right? So let's make it, let's make it like a triangle, a triangle. So, okay, this is a triangle. So you see a triangle here. Can you see my, my paper or not? Can you see it? Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, so the, the heart is like a pyramid, like this. The pyramid is upside down. The pyramid is upside down. That is the heart. Then the heart is going to be rotating from one side, from the right side of the heart, they are going to rotate to the left side, like this. Look at it, this is very important. You will know something very important, so please pay attention. So they are going to rotate like this. So that means that the lateral portion that is the right side is going to get more anterior because the heart is going to rotate normally a very early age stage in fetus are going to rotate from the right to the left, a little bit like that, okay? So this is the anterior wall. So what is more closer to the anterior wall of the chest is going to be the right side of the heart. Are you okay with that? Okay. okay. So now the heart is going to do something else. The heart is going to basically lay down back like this. It's going to go backwards. When they go backwards, you have the apex of the heart the apex of the heart, if you can write down this, apex of the heart is composed by the, uh, by the ventricles. Uh, most of the part is the right ventricle, oh, sorry, uh, part of that is the right ventricle, but mostly of the tip of the, of the heart is being made or formed by the left ventricle, the left ventricle. So now look at this. So we have the heart right to left, and the tip here, this is the tip, the apex, are going to go actually closer to the, to the uh, thoracic wall. So that is, means that every time that the heart is beating, the heart is beating like this. It's touching the thorax somehow. Touching the thorax. Uh, I can't see the video. That's what I'm asking you. I can't see anything. Okay. I'm asking you, you tell me, okay. See, my God. Okay, so you need to tell me. Okay. All right, so here we have the heart again. It looks like a bikini, right? Okay. <laughs> Misha. All right, so, so the heart is like this. Okay, so the heart is a pyramid, as I said, is, that, uh, is upside down. The heart is going to rotate. It's going to rotate. The right side is going to rotate like this. So that means that here we have the thoracic wall and the right side of the heart is closer to the thoracic wall. So it's going to be, it's going to be like, like this. So it's going to rotate to the right, to the left, like this. Okay? All right. Second, we have here the heart is going to go backwards. So they are going to go like laying down like this, back. Right, so it's going to be like laying down back. So, and that is important. Why? Because the apex, the tip of the heart, is going to be beating the, beating the uh, the chest wall. And I want you to write down this, please. 
where is the tip of the heart? The tip of the heart is this. Is a cross, cross, uh, a cross line. Is a cross line between the mid, mid, M I D, mid clavicular line. So I'm probably going to write it out. I don't want to appear in the list. In the list. All right. So we have it's a cross line. between the mid clavicular line and another line is the uh, the fifth intercostal space So where is the intercostal fifth intercostal space is below the nipple or mamilla or mam, mam, or the, the nipple, right? So that is the that is the place of the what they call the apex. Now look at this. I want you to go and follow me. So touch your club, your clavicle on the left side. Touch your clavicle on the other side. So from the beginning to the end, with two fingers, right? One here at the beginning and the end. Okay, we got it? Now, I want you to calculate approximately what is the midpoint, the midpoint of that distance. So that is called the mid, middle, clavicular uh, point. That is the mid clavicular, okay? So you got that point? Okay. So now you're going to go all the way vertical down, all the way vertical down, 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 until the fifth intercostal space. And that is basically around below the, uh, below the nipple, below, below the mamita. okay? So that point is where the apex are going to hit the, the, uh, the wall of the thorax. This is important. Okay, I will tell you now. So, first of all, is that clear or not? So, do you identify the point? So, yeah. what is that point? That is called the apex. That is called the apex. And you are going to check something here. Look at this. You know that the heart is going to produce uh, loop up, loop up, contraction. Okay, contraction. All right, so now, there is some medications, some medications, they can lower the heart rate and that is very dangerous so in order to give the medication you need to check what we call the apical pulse the apical pulse i'm going to write it down that is the apical pulse oh, God. this is the problem i mean i would like to do residential seriously sometimes all right so we have the apical pulse. Apical pulse. All right, so I don't see anybody, but apical pulse. What is the apical pulse? You're going to put the stethoscope. When you're going to use the stethoscope, you put it in that point. In that point. And then you're going to count, count for one minute. So for one minute. You're going to count one, two, three, how many beats in one minute you have. And you already know that the, 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 the beat, the heart rate, the heart rate is going to be, all right, so the heart rate is going to be between 60 to 100, correct? All right. If this medication, for example, that you're going to give knows that you are going to decrease the, the heart rate, you need to check the heart rate first. Because if this is below 60, below 60, you need to stop the medication. Okay? So that is what we call the apical pulse. That is the point where you're going to check the apical pulse. The apical pulse is to count 
more effectively, more actually uh, precise the heartbeats. So now in your mind, you will say, why we don't take the pulse? Okay, the pulse is actually sometimes the, the propagation of the beat are going to change. So they are going to miss two or three, sometimes beats in one minute. So between the radial pulse that you check in, the, in your hand versus the apical pulse, apical pulse is much more precise than the radial pulse. Are you okay with that? Yes. Okay. So the, only, the last thing I want to tell you about the apical pulse is that you need to make the patient to sit up <clears throat> or to lean to the left side, to lean to the left side, to lean to the left side. Why is that? Why? Because doing that, you make the heart have be more in contact with the chest. So the sounds are more clear and you can count very nicely. Be okay with that? Yes. All right. If we will be in class, I will make some demonstration, but we cannot. So, yes, uh, please. That is very important. That is anklets. Another thing that I want to tell you is that the heart is going to be towards the left side, the left side of the chest. So they are going to turn from right to left and go backwards, right? So that means that when somebody has a chest pain or uh, actually uh, they have a chest pain or have um, some myocardial infarction, number one, we have pain on the chest. Pain on the chest is what we call the retro-external pain. Retro means behind the sternum. Retro-external pain. External, external means not external, I said external. That is the sternum, the sternum, right? Behind the sternum. And the pain is radiated to the left side. So when you have myocardial infarction, the pain can go to the left shoulder. So that's why. Right shoulder can happen, but most commonly happen, I was 98% of the cases, irradi uh, radiation of the pain to the left shoulder. Why? Because the heart is leading to the left side of the thorax. Okay, you can have pain in your jaw, in the jaw too, in the jaw, on the mandible here, on the mandible here in the uh, branch of the branch of the arm of the mandible on the left side. So left side mostly is affected in the why? Because of just the position of the heart, as as I mentioned. Okay, so now uh, I uh, I'm not going to ask you to show me where is the apical pulse for obvious reasons because you can do it at home so practice and i want you to uh use your stethoscope you have a stethoscope at home okay so uh, i will teach you how to hold a stethoscope there is a, a very rudimentary way to hold a stethoscope and i'm going to show you what is the elegant way to show to hold a stethoscope with the style so yes we we need to wait for that another time Okay, but put the stethoscope as much as you can and try to find the intersection between the mid-clavicular line with the, with the fifth intercostal space. Fifth intercostal space is the same to say below the nipple. Okay, below the nipple. Okay, so if the patient, patient is having a big breast, actually you need to approximately, before you need to elevate the breast and put it below the uh, uh, on the line where the folding of the breast is happening so that is basically the fifth intercostal space okay all right so that is important all right so let's get this start or oh, continue sorry um so we can't really can we count the bones can we count intercostal spaces yes. i tried but i can't i can't count them <laughs> maybe count on the, under the arm? All right, so that is something I need to teach you on campus. So basically, all right, so I want you to put here your your finger on the on the, this kind of U shape of the sternum. Mm -hmm. Okay, you got that? Yeah. Okay, so now you're going to, I cannot, I'm not going to take my shirt out, but you can move in the sternum, go all the way down, try to pulp very hard. And you will see like a small indentation 
or a big indentation. That we have a protrusion. That means an elevation, yeah. and then go down. Do you see that? You feel that? Go all the way down slowly. Take your time. You will see like some going up, and then the next is going down. Correct. Mm -hmm. So go now side by side on your fingers on the chest, and try to feel a space in between the ribs. Can yeah. you feel that? Mm -hmm. That's right? a second. That is the second intercostal space. Mm -hmm. Then, when you are going to do that, you put your index and try to find the, the third intercostal space, and then the fifth, the fourth intercostal space, and the fifth intercostal space. So that is with the inter, uh, intersection that is going to give you the apical pulse. Okay, so Christina, I want you to take a note. Go to your clinical, and the clinical tell you how to find the fifth intercostal space. Okay, so okay. if I will be the, uh, in class, I will show you, but I can not physical. Okay, all right. Okay. All right. So let's Dr. G. Yes. Who is this? I have a question, Aurora. All right, please go ahead. What if your heart is on the other side? Because uh, we had a patient. One every 25,000 people have what we call the dextrocardia. So this guy. We had a patient that had that. Yeah. Oh, really? Well, actually, yeah. So th there is two types of dextrocardias, complete and complete. So, uh, all right. So it can be the thorax organs to the right side only, or the the uh, the the cardiac organs to the right side with the all the gastrointestinal system on the right side. So there is two types. So very good, huh? It's not that common. Yeah. So what you're going to do in that case, Miss Aurora, you're going to do exactly the same, but you're going to do with the right clavicular line. Okay, excellent. Very good. You're very lucky. It's not, not easy to find those. Okay. Just remember, radiation, radiation of the pain when you have myocardial infarction, that's why they go to the left side. All right, so let's keep going. So we already talked about the apical pulse, and let's, uh, this is a review for bioscience. Heart is a hollow organ, muscular organ who, contain, who contains the uh, blood. All right, so let's go, what is, where is the heart first? The heart is located in the mediastinum. In the mediastinum. Mediastinum. So, what what mediastinum? The middle mediastinum. That is the only thing I want you to remember. So, if you see here, it's a, a sagittal cut of the thorax. We have the anterior mediastinum. We have the posterior mediastinum. We have the middle mediastinum, and we have the superior mediastinum. So, there is elements running in these cavities, but the only one I want you to remember is the middle mediastinum. That is where the heart is located in the center. Okay, anterior, posterior, superior. Anterior, rest fat, posterior, IBC, aorta, superior, the arch of the aorta, lymphatics, and in the middle, the middle mediastinum, MM, is going to be the heart. That is the location of the heart, period. That's all what I want you to know. On, uh, below is going to be over, see, can you see? It's going to be over the diaphragm, over the diaphragm. It's going to rest over the diaphragm. So every time you breathe in, breathe out, your heart is going up, going down. Okay, so that's why when you have myocardial infarctions, uh, they can give you some gastrointestinal uh, problem, especially here in the epigastrium, because of this location of the diaphragm. All right, so conclusion, recap. I want you to remember that the heart is in the middle mediastine. You need to remember the epical, the apex, uh, and that is related to the apical pulse. Apical pulse. Apical pulse, you need to identify where the apical pulse. All right, so now next, let's continue. So here we have, this is an ultrasound, I'm not going to go there. So we have the layers that cover in the heart. The layers that cover in the heart are these. Look at this. This is a membrane that is surrounding the heart. This membrane is a double layer membrane. We already talked about that double layer membrane. This lower layer in the membrane, we have that parietal layer and that visceral layer. All right, so 
but you tell me to double layer memory, but I see only one. Uh, yeah, of course, they are going to be very close to each other, so you cannot differentiate. But in between the parietal layer that is closer to the chest wall and the other uh, layer that is the visceral, visceral means organ. So this layer is closer to the organ. So in between the two layers, we have what, what we call the pericardial space, pericardial space. This pericardial space contains water fluid. This fluid, its electrolytes, etc., are going to decrease the friction of the heart uh, in, uh, with the other organs that are surrounding the heart. So just remember, pericardium is not the heart. Pericardium is not the heart. Very common mistake. Pericardium is not the heart. What is the pericardium? Is the layer that sur surrounds surrounds the heart. It's like you go to uh, to shop. You have two plastic bags. One plastic bag. One plastic bag. And the watermelon that you put it inside, uh, that is going to be the heart. The watermelon is the watermelon. The plastic bag is not the watermelon. Okay. So the same thing with the heart and the pericardium. You okay with that? Is that clear? Yes. Okay. All right, so, oh, why I have this, okay. So this is the clavicle here. So let's make the same length here. And here we have basically the, the midpoint. The midpoint that you identify with your fingers, you go all the way down, all the way down, and you're going to intersect with the fifth intercostal space. Basically, the mamilla is going to be a, a, about here, and that is below. So it's going to be here, all this area. So all this area is going to be the apex. So every time the heart is contracting, it's doing this, boom, 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 boom. Okay, we got it? Yes. All right, so the heart, we are going to make a draw, that you're going to draw it three times. Uh, and we have the three layers of the heart. The inner layer, the inner layer is the endocardium. Endo means inside, cardio means heart. Myocardium means, myo means muscle, cardio means heart. Epicardium means above. Please, 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 don't get confused with the pericardium. This is the epicardium. Epicardium is, yes, part of the heart. Heart, epicardium is one of the layers of the heart. The pericardium are the layers who cover the heart. Nothing to do with the heart itself. It's just the cover of the heart. Okay? All right. All right. So for this, let's go our graphic. So please pay attention. Uh, let me see if I have something here. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So look like a symbol, but it's not. Okay. It's simple, isn't it? All right. So let's start. Here we have... We are going to try to draw a heart. I suggest you to draw this three times at home. Three times at home, okay? Uh, of course. Uh, how I can make it straight? Okay. So this, I'm going to draw it like a square, okay? Because, okay, my ability to draw it is not so nice. So they are going to divide the heart in two components here. So this is your anatomical position, right? My left hand is here. What is in front is the right side, the right. And what is on my right hand, my right hand in front is going to be the left side, opposite, okay? All right, so we have here the right heart this is the right heart and this is the left heart so right and left heart because there is difference between them then we have here are going this wall this wall is called the septum and we have another septum here this is a septum this septum and this is another septum so this septum are actually the walls the ones who divide the, the heart are walls, just walls, okay, walls. Now, <clears throat> these walls are going to divide the heart in four chambers. We have four chambers, four chambers. 
that upper chambers are going to be the atrium. We have another atrium here. We have another ventricle here. Oh, no, a ventricle here. I'm going to put ventricle here. Okay, ventricle here, ventricle. We have another ventricle here. Based on the orientation, this is the left ventricle, this is the left atrium, we have the right atrium, and we have the right ventricle. Okay, I cannot read the message, so please, if you tell me, I don't know what you're putting there, I don't know who it's engaged. Sorry. Huh? It's okay, engaged. Okay, 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 excellent, excellent. All right, so thank you for that. So we have the atrium. All right, so I draw the atrium is smaller than the ventricle. Yes, yeah, because the atriums are slightly smaller than the ventricles, right? Okay, so now, here we are going to have different vessels. One vessel I'm going to draw here in blue is actually getting into the right atrium. So that is the IVC. This is the IVC the IVC, IVC. And we have another vessel coming into the right atrium, that is the superior vena cava. It's the superior vena cava. The superior vena cava, this is the superior vena cava. So you don't, you don't need me to write down, right? You know vena cava, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava. So the blood is coming from here to the heart, into the right atrium. And the superior vena cava is going to collect blood uh, from the head, I will put head, and upper extremities. Upper extremities, head, neck, and upper extremities. And IVC is collecting the rest of the blood. So what happened in the right atrium? In the right atrium is going to receive all the blood from the whole body. So, and then, they're going to pass, they're going to accumulate, accumulate, and they make pressure that are going to open here a valve. I'm going to have a valve that is called the tricuspid valve. One, two, and three. Tricuspid valve. It's going to be called the tricuspid valve. Tricuspid valve. What is the valve doing? Valve is a way that they are going to allow that the blood is going in one direction only. So once the blood is here, the blood is going to pass through the tricuspid valve, tricuspid valve. So the valves are going to be like this. Look at that. This is the atrium. This is the atrium. This is the ventricle down. And the valves are like this, not like that. They are going to be like this. So the blood is coming, pressure increase, and the valves are going to open like this. Now, when the, when the heart is contracting, the blood is trying to come back to the atrium, but the valves are going to close. So it's going to allow only in one direction the blood flow. You okay with that? Yes. Okay. Saying that, they are going to go into, uh, I, you know, the pulmonary artery that is coming from the right ventricle. Uh, I will not be able to, to draw over the heart because if you see here, here we have the pulmonary artery. This is the pulmonary artery here. This is the pulmonary artery. This pulmonary artery is coming from the right ventricle. So in my draw, I cannot draw it on the top. So I'm going to draw like this. Like this. That is going to be the pulmonary artery. Pulmonary artery. And what they are doing is that from the right ventricle, they are going to go through the pulmonary artery towards the lungs. Towards the lungs. So if you see here, all these are going to, on the right side of the heart is going to have the deoxygenated blood. There is no oxygen, basically low oxygen, very low oxygen. So this oxygen is going to uh, be, there is no oxygen on the right side of the heart. So the right atrium and the right ventricle are going to have deoxygenate blood, okay? Now, what happened? So this uh, a blood that contains a lot of carbon dioxide, they go to the lungs. Uh, in the lungs, they are going to have the gas exchange. And what happened? 
there's going to be returning, I'm going to delete this is, uh, here, are going to have four, four vessels coming in. One, two, three, I'm going, I don't accept it here, and four. All right, so these vessels are going to be called the pulmonary veins. The pul pulmonary veins. Pulmonary veins. We have four pulmonary veins. Four, two we have from the right side and the other two from the left side of the lung. So they're coming back four of these. Two from the, from the right and two from the left. So, and the blood, when it's red already, because already happened, the gas exchange, the blood is getting into the left atrium. Getting into the left atrium. Now, here in the right, then in the right side of the heart, we have a, a bulb too. This bulb is going to have only two leaflets. And it's going to open like this. It's not like that. It's going to be like this. So when the blood is reaching a pressure, certain pressure in the atrium, because blood is kept coming, the pressures in the cavity, in the left atrium increase, there is a moment that the pressure is going to open the, the valve. What is the name of this valve? This is called the mitral valve, mitral valve, or called uh, the valve. Excellent. I like that. Bicuspid valve. Okay? Yes. Now, these then are going to get, uh, the left ventricle is going to be uh, uh, filling with, with blood, and the aorta is passing in this way, in this manner. So you see here, this, can you see, can you see this? Yes. It's going to pass behind the pulmonary artery, they're going to pass the aorta. So it's coming out. But in this graphic, I'm going to do this shape. That is the aorta. So this is the aorta. And what happened? The ventricles are going to drain into the aorta, and the aorta is going to distribute to the body. So all this left side of the, of the heart is going to use oxygenate blood. They are going to be oxygenated blood. So the left side, oxygen, the right side, no oxygen, okay? All right, so that is a review. We already know this. They have another valves. These valves are going to be here. These valves are going to allow the blood going uh, away uh, to the aorta, but not coming back from the aorta. This is called the aortic valve. There's a valve here. It's called the aortic valve aortic bulb, and we have another bulb here that is the pul pulmonic bulb, pulmonic, or just the pulmonary artery bulb, pulmonary artery bulb. Okay? All right. So the aortic bulb, I'm going to put it like this, aortic bulb, and the uh, pulmonary artery or pulmonic bulb so this is this here, and the pulmon pulmonary artery or pulmonic artery is here on the right side. All together are going to be called the semilunar valves. Semilunar valves. Semilunar valves. Okay? You okay with that? Yes. Okay. So now, there is a common uh, thing that you need to remember about this. Look at this. So, uh, you see the arteries, arteries, you in general know that going to carry oxygen and the veins are going to carry uh, deoxygenated blood. So there is no oxygen in the veins. But the exception is here in the heart. The pulmonary artery, the pulmonary artery is going to receive venous blood, venous blood. And the aorta is going to receive arterial blood. So it's going to receive oxygenated blood. I want you to remember how to remember this. Very simple. Tell me, 
Can you see in this image the SBC? Watch. Now watch the IBC. Now watch the the left atrium, the pulmonary veins. The pulmonary veins. All right, so what is the direction of the blood into the atriums? And going away from the heart or get into the heart? <coughs> to the heart. To the heart. Look at this. Inferior vena cava. Superior vena cava. Pulmonary veins. Vein, vein, veins. So any vessel who is going to bring blood into the heart, that is going to be called a vein. Okay? So doesn't matter the pulmonary vein is going to carry oxygen, right? So the fact is that they are going to bring blood towards the heart, get into the blood. That is all going to be called a vein, no matter what. Okay? Okay. Wait, 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 sorry. Say it again. I'm sorry. Dr. G, say um, the last part again. What brings blood? Look at the picture. Look at the picture. So yeah. the veins are going to bring blood into the heart. So the veins doesn't matter, doesn't, doesn't mean that it's going in the heart. We're talking about a heart, at the heart, a heart. Doesn't matter, doesn't mean that it's going to carry deoxygenated blood. So veins are, as a definition in the heart, are vessels who are going to bring in blood into the heart. In, in the right side, we have the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, that is deoxygenated blood. It's a vein. In the right, in the, on the left side, we have the pulmonary veins, but you expect deoxygenated blood, but no, they are going to carry oxygenated blood. So it doesn't matter. So just remember the right side of the heart is without oxygen and the left side, whatever happened on the left side is with oxygen, okay? So the conclusion is here that any vessel who bring blood towards the heart is going to be called a vein, period. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Joy, is that clear? Yes, Dr. G. Okay, excellent. So now let's keep going into the into the ventricles. If you see here, the, the blood on the right side is going to go from the right atrium to the right ventricle. So filling up the right ventricle. And the same happened in the left side. The blood from the left atrium pass to the left ventricle and the blood is going to start accumulating in the ventricles. Then this blood, where it go? They need to go out. They need to go out. On the right side, on the right side here, they're going to uh, uh, eject the blood towards the lungs in order to receive oxygen out, out of the heart, out. And the aorta is going to take out from the, from the heart are going to be all of them, any vessel who take out, 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 blood from the heart are going to be called arteries, okay? All right, so another another layer to remember this. L listen to this. Veins, <clears throat> veins is going to tell you is bringing blood into the heart. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Now look at yes. this. Be in, be in, be in. Don't forget that. Be in, vein. I n means in. So it's going to bring in blood into the heart. Be in to the heart. Okay. How about art for out? Art is out. Artery? Art artery is, is out. out. Yes. Art out. <laughs> artery is out. Oh, oh, artery is out. Art yes. sounds like out almost. Okay. All right. So you can you you can use your your uh, you we can be creative yeah. as much as you want. Excellent. <laughs> Very good. All right. So don't forget that. We okay with that? Yes. yes. Okay. Another one. Very simple to remember. We have the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve. The tricuspid valve, tricuspid is called white tricuspid because it has three. 
and the bicuspid valve or mitral valve bicuspid because it's called it's going to have two i will show you a way to remember that because i don't want you to get confused that the tricuspid where is the tricuspid valve or right or left i don't know so where is the mitral valve right or left i don't know so this is a way that can help you to remember that so sorry for those who are left-handed so basically the majority of us we have right hand and left hand right the right hand is a stronger yes or no Yes. Yes. And usually the left hand is more weaker, right? Yes or no? Yeah. So right three. Left two. Three is stronger than two. But that doesn't mean that is stronger the, the valve at all. No. Have the same. But just to remember because three right and two left. Just to remember. Just to way, a way to memorize that. You okay with that? Yes. Yes. All right. So for this, you need to draw three times. You want more, basically. Just do it in your own time because I'm going to ask you a few things from here. So what is in between the right atrium and the right ventricle? Everybody, please. Tricuspid valve. What is in between the left atrium and the left ventricle? Micro. 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 What is in between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery? Pulmonary valve. Pulmonic valve. Pulmonic, pulmonic valve or pulmonary, pulmonary valve. valve, or you can call that semilunar valve. Okay? What is in between the right, uh, the left ventricle and the aorta? You know very well, aortic valve, or call that semilunar valve. You okay with that? Yes. Yes. All right. So that is the review of the heart that we did in bioscience. Um, I was right. the, the tricuspid valve, it has um, more pressure from the whole body. Is that why it has three, three, um, no, 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 no. Release on it? No. Oh, that is a good question. Huh? Yeah. Know. And the bicuspid uh, no. valve has only from the, the, the lungs, so it's less pressure. Yeah, so only has why two, they have three leaflets. I never two leaves. This myself, huh? And three leaves. Right, so that, device, that, so it's a lot more pressure, a lot more blood to handle. So well, it no, 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 not necessarily that. They have okay. the same thread. You have the heart in adult. The left side of the heart have more pressure than the right side. Mm, okay. But in fetal life, in fetal life is the opposite. The right side is having more pressures than the left side. So I'm going to check on that. Huh? This is very kind of, I don't want to answer, yeah, God made us like this, but I don't know, but I want to know what is the cause. I will check on that. Thank you for that. Okay? All right. So we have this. Just remember the myocardium. When you're talking about the myocardium, the myocardium is going to be the big muscle that is composed by the, uh, the walls, composing the walls of the heart. The myocardium is more thinner in the atriums and more thicker on the on the ventricles. On the ventricles. Between the right and the left ventricle, who is the thicker, obviously is going to be the left ventricle. Why? Because that is where it's coming the aorta, who is going to pump out blood to all the body. Basically, all the body are going to be pumping the blood from the left ventricle. All right, so let's talk about the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. Let me see if I have a picture. There you are. All right, so listen, this is question for exam. We have the pulmonary circuit, pulmonary circuit, and or oh, minor circuit, or called minor circuit, because I will tell you why it's called minor circuit. And the other one, we have the systemic circuit. Systemic circuit. Circuit of what? Of the blood. Systemic. Systemic means systemic. How many systems we have in your body? 11 systems. So all these fluids go to the whole systems. So that's why it's called systemic, systemic circuit. Okay? All right. So look at this. <coughs> the, pulmonary, uh, the pulmonary circuit are going to go from here. So you start in the right atrium, number one. Then you go to the right ventricle, number two. Then they go to the pulmonary artery, 
pulmonary artery. This is the pulmonary artery. Pulmonary artery, number three. They go to the lungs. To the lungs. And then they are going back into the left atrium. Left atrium. And that is number five. So that is, if you see here, we have this is the heart. This is the lungs here. The lungs here. So the circuit is going to go this way. And then come back here. So go from the left, uh, from the right atrium, um, uh, are going to go to the uh, to the uh, sorry to to the right ventricle. Sorry for that. So I, I need to correct myself. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I make a mistake. So that's the pulmonary circuit start here, and I will show you how to memorize that right ventricle the right ventricle one they go then to the pulmonary artery two they go to the lungs three and they go four to the left atrium so basically go from the right ventricle to the left atrium that is the pulmonary circuit okay now yes. the the, uh, the systemic circuit are going to start again but from the ventricle, but in this case, from the left ventricle. They're going to start from the left ventricle, they go to the aorta, and the aorta, they go all the way to distribute to whole body, the whole body. And where they're going to end, they're going to end into the right atrium. So the, the systemic circuit are going to start from the left ventricle and is going to end into the right atrium. Okay with that? All right. So... You, you have the idea, right? So look at this. You have the heart here. You have the lungs here. So the circuit is going to go from the right ventricle, go all the way back, and here. So it's compared to the systemic, compared to the systemic that is going to go through the uh, through the aorta all the way to the body and then come back. So all the circuit going to, so from the left ventricle are going to end into the right atrium. And a small circuit, the pulmonary circuit, go from the right ventricle to the to the to no. the left atrium. Okay, you okay with that? Yes. All right. It's not clear. I'm not satisfied. So let's make it easy. No. All right. So number one, when, when I'm going to ask you about pulmonary circuit or systemic circuit, always are going to start in the ventricles. Always in the ventricles. Write it down. That always in the ventricles. And where it's going to end? They are going to end into the atriums. So whatever I ask you, systemic or uh, pulmonary circuit, that is going to start in the ventricles. And where they both ends, they end into the atriums. The systemic circuit is called to the major cir circuit. Major circuit. So look at this. Pulmonary circuit or minor circuit? Systemic circuit or major circuit? You okay with that? Yes. Okay. Now, how to remember that? The way to remember that is this. So you have to remember the the uh, the pulmonary circuit. If you remember the pulmonary circuit, you can remember the systemic circuit. The pulmonary circuit is very simple. It's pulmonary circuit or the minor. It's very close. They need to go to the lungs and go back to the heart. It's a very short trip, right? Very short trip. Very short trip. Very short trip. So let's make a trip. So you want to make a trip? Let's do a trip. Let's make a trip. Let's make a trip. How we are going to do that trip? Let's make that short trip. We are going to rent an RV. You want to rent an RV? Okay, let's rent an RV. And where are we going? Let's go to LA. Let's go to LA. RV to LA. So rent an RV to go to LA. Rent, right? Uh, uh, RB, the right ventricle, and let's go to LA, the left atrium. Is that clear? Yes. All right. So now, if you know what is the pulmonary circuit, is the trip to LA, right? So what is that? RB, you have your RB, recreational vehicle, RB, the right ventricle, and let's go to LA, the left atrium. Now, if you know that, you know what is the systemic circulation. Oh, okay, so it's a systemic circulation or major circulation. And I know that the, the minor circulation 
start in the RB, the major circulation are going to start in the LB, the left ventricle. And where they're going to end? They're going to end into the right atrium. Right so atrium. It's the opposite of the pulmonary circulation. So if the pulmonary circulation starts with the right ventricle, the systemic are going to start in the left ventricle. If the, if the minor circulation or pulmonary circulation is going to end in LA, the left atrium, the systemic ends into the right atrium, RI. RA, RA. You okay with that? Yes. All right, so don't forget that. All right, so let's talk about the coronary arteries. Talking about the coronary arteries is very important to know this. Very important. All right, so the coronary arteries are going to arise from the aorta, from the aorta. So at the beginning of the aorta, we have the ascending, arch of the aorta, descending, we will talk about another time, but we have the coronary artery. So I'm going to stop here and have some details. I want just you to re remember that the coronary arteries are going to be two arteries, two arteries, two arteries, two arteries, right and left coronary artery. Coronary artery in Latin means coronary like a crown. So is these arteries are going to surrounding the heart like a crown, right? And these vessels, what they're doing is to give blood supply to the myocardium, okay? Yes. <clears throat> okay, so now the coronary artery, this coronary artery going to, I want a big picture, it's not a big picture. Uh, okay, so I can miss time. Okay, there you are, that's the best we got. All right, so this coronary artery is the cause when they go blockage, the coronary artery, coronary artery is going to measure about four millimeters, four millimeters only diameter. So when you eat too much cholesterol, when you have too much cholesterol, the, the, the lining of the coronary arteries are going to get, get deposit of the cholesterol here. This is going to decrease the oxygen of the myocardium, and that is going to enter into ischemia. Ischemia. And ischemia, if that persists, is going to get into infarction. Ischemia means that it's low oxygen to the tissue. And infarction is the dead tissue. Dead tissue. I want you, we have homework. The homework is going to, don't do it. So put a rubber band around your finger. Put a rubber band around your finger, very tight. So you basically, what you are is cutting the blood supply to the finger, right? So what are you going to feel? You feel changes on temperature. It's going to get cold. It's going to get blue. It's then it's going to get pain. Why they get pain? Why they get pain? Why? Because the terminal nerves, we have nerves too in the, in the finger. These nerves are going to die because they do not receive blood, do not receive oxygen. So they start to degenerate and that's why it's going to cause the pain, right? If that is going, if you put the, the tourniquet or the rubber band more than 10 minutes, you, after 10 minutes, you don't have finger anymore. So it's dead, it's dead because the cells need oxygen to do all the functions that they need, okay? So ischemia means poor oxygen in the tissue, and if this ischemia is going to persist, it's going to lead into infarction. The, th the cells are going to be dead. Is that clear or not, please? Yes. Okay, so now this, when you have, and this, the finger is like your heart, and the vessels that they running from your hand to the finger are the coronary arteries. So if you put a rubber band, coronary arteries are blocked, do not produce, do not deliver oxygen anymore. So that is ischemia, ischemia. And the ischemia are going to lead, if that persists, it's going to continue, it's going to end into the death of the cells, dead tissue. So that is what we have, we have ischemia and infarction. Myocardial ischemia and myocardial uh, infarction. 
What is infarction is dead tissue. So now the uh, the coronary arteries are going to be blocked in any part, any point, could be at any point. And remember, the coronary arteries are going to have many branches, many branches. If one of these branches are blocked, that area is going to have ischemia, and if that persists, if that persists, produce uh, infarction. Okay, so it depends what is the artery or the branch of the artery that is being blocked in order to produce that effect of ischemia and infarction. Okay? Yes. All right. So we have infarction, and the other word that I want you to remember, infarction, are going to be the word necrosis. Necrosis. Necrosis and infarction means dead tissue. Necrosis and infarction uh, means dead tissue. This dead tissue, so what we call here is myocardial infarction or myocardial necrosis. Technically, are the same, but in medicine, there is a way to talk, right? We have ways to, uh, uh, to, to express ourselves. And we never said, we never said uh, heart necrosis. No, we don't say that. We said myocardial or heart infarction heart infarction when you're going to use necrosis necrosis you're going to use when you have a necrotic tissue like burns burns necrotic tissue after you have a burn very a very bad burn that tissue become black because that tissue is is dead already why become black why when you burn something become black because our body contain carbon Remember the organic, we have C-H-O-N, right? C-H is organic. So when you burn, you you, evapor you get rid of all the elements and what is called is going to, is going to end just the carbon, the carbon, the carbon. That's why it's called, it's going to be black when it's burned. You okay with that? When you go and, uh, and you have, you burn a wood, a lumber, whatever, uh, you're going to, that is, organic right what how is going to end if you burn it black why because everything is going away but the carbon is still there it's going to that's why it's called carbon carbon it's going to be black this necrosis can be used this word when you are having burns or when you are doing histological views so necrosis in the microscope when you see a tissue and you see oh there's necrosis here right so that is where the term we use necrosis infarction just to make it clear is more a clinical expression the clinical word it's clinical infarction of the myocardium or infarction of the heart infarction of the brain infarction of the brain is another word we call to a stroke infarction of the spleen infarction of the liver infarction of the kidney infarction of the testicle infarction of the of the uh, ovarian or, or ovary. So those are going to be called infarctions. Okay, we got it? Yes. All right. So that is about the heart. I'm going to what give blocks, you... What blocks those arteries? The, um, the cholesterol? What? What, what blocks those arteries? The what ones who's blocking the arteries are going to be the cholesterol. Cholesterol. So you eat too much. You how you eat? You like a turkey fried chicken? You like me? No. I like no, it. Yes, good. good. Okay. So if you eat Kentucky fried chicken, Wendy's, whatever, you have cholesterol deposits in your base in your vessels. And we will talk about the HDL, LDL, to probably today. Just remind me, please. All right. Okay. Thanks. All right. So, so, yes. Uh, can you mention about the angi angina pectoris? The difference between the angina pectoris for the Infraction? Yes. Please Very thank good. you. Angina, angina, angina. The word is angina. Everybody knows what how to write angina, right? So let me, I want to see faces. No, no, I don't want to do it myself. Okay. All right, so angina, angina is a blockage, partially blockage of the coronary arteries that cause pain. All right, so remember the finger, the finger, when you rub around the finger, 
the finger is going to be cold and then pain, right? Because the nerves are dying, right? That is called ischemia, but you can call this, that pain is called an ischemic pain because the pain is caused by ischemia in that case. The same happened with the coronary arteries in the heart, like the finger. So you have obstruction of the cholesterol, obstruction of the coronary arteries by deposit of cholesterol. They're going to be basically lowering the oxygen supply to the myocardium. So the myocardium enter into ischemia. That ischemia, when this still is going to be for certain periods of time, could be three, four minutes enough, you're going to start dying the nerves that are in the muscle of the heart. And that produces pain. That ischemic pain is actually what we call the angina. Ischemic pain, angina. What is angina? Write it down. Angina is an ischemic pain of the heart. Ischemic pain of the heart. That is the right way to mention that. Angina is the ischemic pain of the heart. All right? Angina. So we, we can talk about angina, the variant, angina, stable, unstable, the Wolf Parkinson Wolf, uh, the Wolf Parkinson Wolf. Uh, we have different type of angina that can be stable and unstable. That is a basic. So this is not your time. But what I want just you to remember, angina means pain. Pain. What kind of pain? Ischemic pain. Why is the ischemic pain? Because the coronary arteries are blocked. Could be one or two or whatever, are blocked. And they are not going to give blood supply to the finger, no, to the heart. So that can cause pain. Because the nerves that are immersed of the, in the middle of the myocardium is, are dying. And that causes pain. The radiation of the pain can go to the left shoulder or to the left jaw, because the heart is on the left side. Okay? All right, so, so that is a very brief uh, talk uh, about angina. I wish I could talk better. So how angina can occur? Why people have angina when you are doing exercises? That is coming later. Okay? All right. Okay, so let's have our uh, break, uh, 10 minutes break. And we can continue with the last part of the class. It's going to be tight, a little tight time, but actually, yeah, you need some break. Okay? All right, so I will see you at 125. Any question? Thank you, Dr. G. Thank you, thank you. Anna, good morning. <laughs> what are you doing?
Nigga, what's up? Not much, man. Hello, oh my God, it's so cold here. Put the heater. Meantime. You have a 16 pound cat on your lap. How can you be cold? No, no. right now they are, they are sleeping together. I'm just ah. Look. They ditched you. You see them? Yeah. Yeah. They want to go to the balcony. There's a lot of birds. I cannot take control. All right, so let's let's get a start. Okay. All right. So, talking about the blood. Okay. The blood is uh, a fluid, as you know, as a classic classify as connective tissue. Correct. So what I want you to uh, remember is that the okay, the blood. How much blood do we have in our body? For for clinical, for med search, for pharmacology, we are going to use uh, actually the volume of four liters. Four liters. 
So how much is R4 liters? Four liters, if you remember a bottle of uh, wine, it's going to be about 750, 725 mLs. So it's about one liter. That is what we have in one bottle of wine. So if you take four bottles and a half of wine, so imagine carry in the display four bottles of wine and a half of, basically four to five bottles of wine, that is the weight of the blood that basically we have in our body. So if you have four bottles or five bottles of wine, that is that volume is the amount of blood that you have in your body. You okay with that? So just to make it easy to remember. Four to five liters are going to use four liters for uh, teaching purposes. Okay? You okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So now, the uh, basically the blood is going to be distributed uh, mostly we have the kidneys in the and the abdominal organs abdominal organs so 10 percent uh 15 percent will be in the brain but most of the kid most most of the blood one quarter percent or 25 percent one quarter of the blood are going to be running through the kidneys so it's very well vascularized that kid okay all right so talking about the vessels, the vessels are going to be about, a, if you take all the vessels, all the arteries, all the veins, all the arterioles, all the capillaries are going, to, if you put it in a line one after another, you're going to have about this amount of miles, 25,000 miles. That is going to actually go around the world two and a half times. So that is how much of these highways, streets that we have in our body, circulating blood are going to be in each individual, each person. So each person you can go around the world two and a half times. So that is how much vessels we have in our body. All right, so the functions of the blood. The blood are going to have, uh, this is question for the exam, transportation, regulation, and protection. Okay, the TPR, transportation, protection and regulation. Transportation is going to transport the gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide. They're going to transport all the amino acids, the fatty acids, uh, cholesterol, etc., triglycerides and the, um, and the carbohydrates. And waste products. Waste products, for example, we have the, uh, they are going to be the urea. The urea is the waste product that is going to be eliminated through the kidneys. The, the blood is going to have the pH. What is pH? pH means the power of hydrogens. Power of hydrogens. Hydrogen, you already know, hydrogen is like this, plus, is acid. Acid. All right, so what is the pH of the blood? This is a question for the exam. The pH of the blood is going to be 7.35 to 7.45. That is the normal range of the blood. If the, if the pH is too high, you can die. If the, if, the, if the pH is too low, you can die. You can die if they reach 7.9, you are actually the patient die. If the pH go lower than 35 to 6.9, that is going to actually patient die, okay? All right, All right. So fluid balance, because the water is going to be in the, basically water is running into the blood. So the blood is not only red blood cells. It's going to have a big component of water. And we that is basically a review from bioscience. Heat, heat is going to be regulation of the temperature when your cheeks are uh, uh, red because it's too too hot outside. So the vessels are basodilate, getting closer to the skin, and that is going. This basodilation is actually running blood, and the blood is going to be basically. Uh, all the heat is being taken by the sweat. So when you are sweating, the sweat evaporates and the vessels, when they're basodilate, the blood is getting closer to the skin. So that's why this evaporation is going to take the heat, overheat from your body. If you have a uh, cold, the vessels are going to basoconstrict, are going to basoconstrict, putting away or far away from the skin and two, in order to keep the temperature of your body. 
All right, so we have uh, carry hormones, oxygen, nutrients. We already talked about that. The pH is 735 to 745, fluid balance. I, I want just to let you know one thing, the dehydration. Dehydration. We have a patient that is like this, normal, 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 uh, 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 normal, uh, I mean, no accumulation of fluid. And we have here a pa the same patient like this now, with a lot of fluid in the body. Tell me, this patient, this patient here, this patient, this patient is dehydrated or very well hydrated? Dehydrated. The patient is totally dehydrated. This patient is totally dehydrated. Why? Because remember that for the rest of your life, that the, the, the hydration of the patient is, weak, uh, when you're, the patient is hydrated because the water mostly are in the blood vessels. The blood, the water need to be in the blood vessels, besides of the intracellular, etc. right? But the blood need to be, the water need mostly running on the blood. When that water escape from the blood stream and go into the tissues, that's why you start to have edemas. You start to accumulate water outside of the vessels. And that patient is totally dehydrated. The water need to be into the blood vessels, into the blood. You okay with that? So when you have edema, don't actually think that the patient is very well hydrated. It's accumulating fluid, yes, but not in the right place. The right place will be in the vascular space, in the vessels, not on the tissues. Okay, we got it? Yeah. Okay. Protection are going, that, that uh, the blood is going to be running, what is going to be running the uh, white cells, right? The white cells are going to be, a, we have the classification of white cells very soon, and that is going to protect you against infections. One of these elements are going to be the antibodies. Antibodies, antibody is produced by the lymphocytes. Lymphocytes, lymphocytes B. This antibody is by short is called AB or called the immunoglobulin. Immunoglobulin. In, immunoglobulin. And the abbreviation for immunoglobulin is IG. So IB and IG is exactly the same. So what are doing these antibodies? Now that we have COVID-19, antibodies means are going to be markers for destruction. markers for destruction. So what is doing this? This is the bacteria or the virus. The antibodies are going to come and mark, like putting a paint on the, on the, on the foreign uh, organism, like bacteria and viruses. So these marks for destruction are going to allow the lymphocyte T, the lymphocyte T, that is the other type of lymphocyte T, to say, oh, this is a mark for destruction the lymphocytes T and kill the bacteria or destroy the virus, okay? So just remember, antibodies are running into the blood. It's a very important component. And those are just markers for destruction. So if I ask you in the future, what is an antibody or what is an immunoglobulin, you will tell me are markers for destruction, markers for destruction. The lymphocytes B, this is the lymphocytes B, are going to send in, uh, antibodies are going to produce antibodies and they are going to mark the bacterial virus. Once it's marked the bacterial virus for destruction, the lymphocytes T is coming, are coming and destroy the organism. The other thing that I want you to remember is the coagulation factors. Coagulation factors are running into the bloodstream. The coagulation factors are proteins. Don't forget that. Proteins are proteins are proteins are proteins. Where are being the proteins, where are produced these coagulation factors? The coagulation factors are produced in the liver. The liver have the coagulation factors. That are the proteins are being produced by the liver. Coagulation factor. These proteins are going to contribute for the coagulation process. 
I'm going to give you additional thing here. What are the functions of the liver? I want you to remember A, B, C, and D. A, B, C, and D. A, B, and C, and D. What is the function of the liver? One is to produce albumin. What is albumin? Albumin is another protein. What is the B? B, the, the liver is produced produce the bile. It's going to produce bile. What is C? The liver is going to produce the coagulation factors. Coagulation factors. And D, what is D? Is the detoxification. They are going to detoxify the ammonia, remember, into urea, for example, right? So those are, those are the ABCD. The ABCD of the liver. But the liver produces albumin, bile, coagulation factors, that is the topic today, and produce that detoxification. So those are functions of the liver. The liver has 512 functions, but I, I want you to remember a few of them. One of the most important is going to be the ABCD. It's not in any book, so please take advantage of that, ABCD. So that is going to guide you, for example, when somebody has liver problems, you need to know what laboratory tests are relevant for that patient. So the patient will have low levels of albumin because the liver is sick, hepatitis, cirrhosis. So that is one laboratory test. Low levels of albumin, you remember in bioscience, albumin is going to have the oncotic pressure. Albumin is a protein, is the protein that we have more abundant in the blood. This protein attracts water, attracts water. So if you have low levels of albumin, because the liver is not working, is weak, uh, and the water starts to escape from the vascular space into the tissue that produces edemas. The bile. The bile is actually another function of the liver. The bile is going to collect many other elements and produce the bile and put it into the gallbladder. The gallbladder do not produce bile. The gallbladder is going to storage the bile. The one who produces the bile is the liver. The coagulation factors. If the coagulation factors, what is doing the coagulation factors? So for that, I need to tell you something. Tell me, do we need to have coagulation all day? Yes or no? Do we need the coagulation to be present all day in our life? Yeah. Yes. The answer is yes. Answer is yes. For example, you have here, you go here, the same example I give you in the past. So you have this your skin, and boom, you do this, just that, just this, just this. That already you break down some capillaries, small vessels. You're breaking down them, you're bleeding, but you don't produce bruises. Why? Because immediately the coagulation are going to be effective. So are going to happen. Coagulation do not allow bleeding. So how you can explain, for example, a person who have bruises very easy, I don't know, I have a bruise here. I don't know, I didn't hit anything, a, a, a bruise. Why? Because probably the liver is not working. Why? Because the liver is not producing the coagulation factors. That could be a cause of bruises or bleeding, okay? And the detoxification are going to be taking the ammonia into urea. You remember, you remember, you need to remember that, well, that is nutrition. I'm not going to go on that. But proteins are going to, proteins are going to, uh, excess of proteins are going to be, uh, they need to get rid, the body need to get rid of the excess of protein. The proteins cannot be a store. The proteins cannot be a store. The protein, we don't have storage, we don't have a storage of proteins. So if you eat excess of proteins, that proteins, they need to be, basically deaminated. That is bioscience, by the way. And this protein produces the ammonia. The ammonia then is taken by the liver, and the liver transforms the ammonia into less toxic, that is the urea. The ammonia is very toxic, very, very, very toxic. And the liver is going to take that ammonia and detoxify and make the ammonia less toxic, turning into urea. And the urea then is going to be eliminated through the through the uh, kidney. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the, uh, the 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 blood here. The blood here. We have a whole blood. This is a laboratory tube. A laboratory tube. And this laboratory tube, when they take a sample of blood, you have all this. You see red, right? But they have some measurements here. 
So there is tubes that are going to be, depends the lab, a little bit bigger, smaller, whatever, right? But actually they have a measurement here. This blood are going to be having a lot of components. The blood are going to be composed by water plus nutrients, carbohydrates, lipids, uh, uh, fatty acids, plus hormones, all hormones are running, we talked in the past, enzymes are going to have electrolytes. You know what is electrolytes? Electrolytes are ions that are in body fluids. That is called electrolytes. We have actually the coagulation factors, that coagulation factors, coagulation factors. We have the white cells, we have the platelets, and we have the red blood cells. See, all these components are going to be part of the blood. Now, I want to, you to do an experiment. Experiment. Let's make a container, a glass container, transparent container, and put soil here. Soil. Soil. This soil are going to make all the water basically brown. Correct? Now, let's leave the, this water and soil. Water and soil. Now, let's let's wait for probably five, ten minutes, and don't move the soil in the water. So what happened at the end? The soil is going to get on the bottom, and the fluid is getting on the top. Yes or no? Right? So why is that? Because in the water, we have soil. This soil are heavier than the water. So that's why by gravity, the soil is going to go to the bottom of the, of the, of the container. So it's exactly the same what happened in the blood. In the blood, we have all these elements, hormones, enzymes, electrolytes, we have, uh, we have white cells, etc. And some elements are more heavier than others. So if you leave the tube for a while, you will see that they're going to be exactly the same with the, uh, what happened with the soil and the water. So the heavier elements, the heavier elements are going to go to the bottom. Who are these heavier elements? The heavy elements are going to be basically the red blood cells. The, uh, those are the red blood cells. Red blood cells. This is the red blood cell. From all the volume, you will see that at the bottom is going to be the red blood cells here. Right? So if you have all this measurement, you have here, from here, the distance from here to here in that tube is going to be your 100%. 100%. But if you measure the distance from here, from here to here, that is going to be basically 45% of all the blood. So 45% of your volume of the blood are formed by red blood cells. 45%. That is a question for the exam. So what is the percentage of, uh, of, uh, of red blood cells in, in the blood? 45%. The rest are going to be elements that are not as heavier as the as the as the red blood cells so they are going to be on the top here we we have everything but not the red blood cells so here we have the water the nutrients the hormones the enzymes electrolytes we have some protein coagulation factors we have the white cells here and the platelets so all this is what we call the plasma 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 so what is plasma plasma is what is plasma plasma basically is the uh, blood without red blood cells. Okay, all right. So now here we have uh, we have basically this is about fifty five percent number that you need to remember for the exam. Forty five percent are the red blood cells, but there is one one percent. That's why I put approximately one percent. These one percent are going to be in between the plasma, the plasma and the and the red blood cells. So this is 1%, about 1%. See, they put 0.9%, it's about 1%. What we have here in this transition between the, uh, the plasma and the red blood cells are going to be the platelets and the white cells. So that is the area where it's going to be. What does it mean? The, the heavier elements are the red blood cells, less heavier are going to be the platelets and the and the, and the white cells, and less, less heavier are going to be the rest, okay? That is called plasma. How much is the plasma? 
plasma is 55%. Okay with that? All right. Okay. All right, so now, here we have one word that you need to remember that is called the hematocrit. The hematocrit. 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 The hematocrit is the percentage of, uh, the, uh, is the re representing the percentage of red blood cells that there are coming from the blood. So what is the hematocrit here? Hematocrit is 45%. 45%. That is what we call hematocrit. Hematocrit is the percentage of red blood cells that represents the whole volume of the blood. So 45% of all this distance. If this is 100%, if we, if we say, for example, if this is 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters, this is going to measure, this distance are going to be 4.5, and this is 5.5, the plasma. So 4.5, from 10, from 10 centimeters is 45%. So that is what we call the hematocrit. hematocrit. In few words, what is hematocrit is a percentage of red blood cells. Red blood cell percentage. Red blood cell percentage. That is the hematocrit. Are you okay with that? Yes. Yes. Okay. So the blood are going to be formed on the red bone marrow. So what elements are formed in the in the red bone marrow? Red bone marrow that is in the epiphysis of the of the of the bones are going to have a function that is called the hematopoiesis. Hematopoiesis. These hematopoiesis are having three components: the erythropoiesis, erythropoiesis, and we have the white cells, and we have the platelets. The platelets. That is the function of the red bone marrow to produce hematopoiesis are these three lines of, of structures. Erythro, that are the red blood cells, white cells, and the platelets. Remember, by bioscience, platelets are not cells. They are not cells. Platelets are not cells. The platelets are coming from another cell that is called the megakaryocyte. Megakaryocyte. That is review, so it's not new. This megakaryocyte is a cell. These cells are going to be break uh, going to be cut it in pieces. Each piece is going to be a platelet. So that's why platelets are not a cell. They are part of a cell. So this megakaryocyte, if you have a cake, you cut it in many, many parts. Each part is a platelet. Okay? But the, that piece is not the whole cake. Right? Okay. All right. So that is basically that platelet. All right, so let's talk about the, uh, I want to see, yeah, we, come on, what time is it, please? One fifty. Okay. All right, so I need to, I cannot elaborate that much because of the time, but I will try to do my best. Okay, so red blood cell, red blood cell is the same to say erythro, erythrocyte. Erythrocyte. I'm going to tell you the story of the red blood cells. The red blood cells are going to start from the bone. So here we have, okay, bones on bone here, right? That is the bone. And here we have the red bone marrow. The red bone marrow are going to produce the red blood cells. The red blood cells are going to lose the nucleus, lose the nucleus at the time that is coming out of the of the bone. So the red blood cells at the beginning are going to be like this round, but the red blood cells, when they're coming out, they are losing the nucleus, and that actually makes the shape of the red blood cell like this, a biconcave, biconcave uh, concave disc. Why? Because the, the red blood cells do not have nucleus at the time that is leaving the bone. So that means the red blood cells, circulating red blood cells, cannot reproduce because they don't have the DNA. Okay? The red blood cells are going to make here, the red blood cells are going to contain a protein called the hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. Hemo hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. The hemoglobin is the HB, right? Are going to, is it going to be a protein? It's a protein. 
hemoglobin. It's a protein that is going to carry oxygen and carbon dioxide. Okay. So question here, the hemoglobin, how many molecules of hemoglobin do you think we have in each red blood cell? Many people say, oh, we have hemoglobin in the red blood cell, or we have one molecule of hemoglobin. That is not true. We have actually many molecules of hemoglobin for every single red blood cell. These are going to be about 24,000 molecules of hemoglobin in every single red blood cell. In every single red blood cell, we have 24,000. Uh, do you need to remember that number? No, yes, I want you to remember that we have thousands and thousands and thousands of molecules of hemoglobin inside the red blood cell. What is the function of the hemoglobin? Is to carry oxygen and carbon dioxide. Now, this red blood cell, the red blood cell, they have a span life, span, a span life of 120, 120 days. So four months, yes, huh? days. What is coming in my Spanish here? Days. 120, 120 days. 120 days. That is the whole life of the red blood cell. The red blood cell, then, when they actually go have 120 days, they are going to be recognized by the spleen. The spleen. The spleen is going to say, how old are you, red blood cell? 120. Okay, come, I need to kill you. So that is what is doing the spleen. This one of the many functions of the spleen is to take the old red blood cells and destroy the red blood cells. They're going to destroy the red blood cells. They're going to destroy the red blood cells. In general, a spleen is going to be the cemetery, cemetery of the cemetery of the red blood cells. How much they live? 120 days, 120 days. Once the, red, the spleen is going to destroy the red blood cell, the red blood cell, this is open, and the whole hemoglobins are going to be out. They are going to destroy the cell membrane of the red blood cells, and the hemoglobin are going to come out. And they go to where? To the blood, to the bloodstream, the hemoglobin. The hemoglobin combined with the water and that is going to produce the bilirubin. 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 What is bilirubin? It's a pigment. This bilirubin then is taken by the liver. The liver. And the bilirubin is taken by the liver. The liver is going to add other substances to produce the bile. That is the whole story of the of the of the red blood cell. Bilirubin is a pigment. Now, when you have, for example, your, your skin is yellow, the skin is yellow, that is called jaundice. Jaundice. Or called ictericia. It's the same. Jaundice. So why jaundice is normal? No, it's not normal. So you actually become yellow. Why can be yellow? You can be yellow for many reasons. For example, the liver is not working. The liver is not working. If the liver is not working, bilirubin is going to be keep running on the bloodstream. They go to the arteries under the skin and they produce that jaundice. They're going to produce the yellow skin. That is one, one scenario. The other scenario will be that you have too many, too many red blood cells dying. And that too many red blood cells dying is called the hemolysis. 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 Hemolysis means destruction of red blood cells. So you have so many red blood cells being destroyed that you have excess of hemoglobin. And the liver is working properly in this case, but the liver have a limit. They cannot uh, keep up with all the hemoglobin running uh, in the bloodstream. So they are going to catch up some of the hemoglobin, but some hemoglobin is still going to produce bilirubin in combination with the water, hemoglobin plus water, is going to produce bilirubin and produce jaundice. So there is two common causes of jaundice. One, liver, liver damage, or actually excess of destruction of red blood cells. That is what we need to remember. You okay with that? Yes. Okay. 
All right, so just uh, erythrocyte or red blood cells. So this is the biconcave, biconcave. That is when they lose the, re the nucleus after they coming out from the bone. And just to give, a, give you an idea, we have about in one drop of blood, one drop of blood, we have 330 million red blood cells. How to make sense of that? Imagine this. How, many, how much is the population of the United States? Right now, it's about 330, 350 million people. 350 million, according to this data. 350 million. It's like you are United States, whole United States is like a drop of water or drop of blood. Drop of blood. In that drop of blood, we have 350 red blood cells. And that is basically how much blood uh, we have in, it, in, in this, uh, in blood, in the amount of red blood cells. All right, so let's talk about the white cells. The white cells, we have two, two groups of white cells. We have the, the leukocyte. Leuco means white. Leuco means white. And we, we have, basically, we have the granulocytes and the agranulocytes. The granulocytes are the white cells. This is the nucleus of the some of the white cells. But the granulocytes, they have here a lot of these dots. What are these dots? Dots are going to be enzymes that looks in the microscope as a granules. So that's why are called granulocytes. Who are, who are the ones who contain these granulocytes? Are going to be the neutrophils. The neutrophils. These neutrophils, neutrophils are the first, first, uh, first response on, on infection. So neutrophils are like the marines. These neutrophils are going to be basically the, the marines, and they're very, very, very good warriors. These neutrophils, what they are doing is to produce the phagocytosis. Phagocytosis, phagocytosis. So what does that mean? That the bacteria is going to be eaten by the white cell, this, uh, this neutrophil. When the bacteria is getting, is eaten by phagocytosis and get inside the neutrophil, the enzymes, the granules are going to come and open and destroy the bacteria. So that is a neutrophil. Neutrophils are going to live, span life are going to be three days. Three days, three days. They are going to be very, very good. I would call the marines and ninjas. The, this guy, neutrophil, can kill 10 bacteria at the same time, at the same time, at the same time. But there's something bad here about the neutrophils. The neutrophils start to be so much good warriors that kill all the bacteria, all the virus they can, 10 at the same time, that they actually become crazy. Literally, they become crazy. They actually are actually uh, thirsty of blood. They want to kill whatever is in front of them. And they are going to even start killing, killing your own normal cells. So basically what they are doing, these neutrophils are going to commit suicide about three days in order to prevent damage to your normal tissue. The granulocytes, granulocytes. All right? So now, uh, the neutrophils. Then we have the eosinophils. Oh, by the way, you know what? I I wish I could have more time. So I don't know how we can do this because this exam always is having this problem. Neutrophils are elevated. High, high, uh, high uh, uh, neutrophils when you have an acute infection. That's why when you are doing the um, um, uh, CBC, what is CBC? CBC is a complete blood count. And what you're going to see here, you're going to see the red blood cells, you're going to see the amount of white cells, the amount of platelets, right? So those are basically what is the CBC. You're going to calculate the hemoglobin and the hematocrit. So those are the CBC. So in the CBC, when you have an infection, you will see the neutrophils are elevated that means an acute infection, acute infection, acute infection. Then we have, a, I'm going to start with the monocytes. The monocytes are this, like this. It's like a mouth fish nucleus. This is the nucleus of the monocyte. This is called a granulocyte 
because do not have enzymes, do not have enzymes. These monocytes are going to be elevated when you have a chronic infection, chronic infection. How useful is the CBC, right? So you can tell by CBC if the infection is acute and acute is actually a short period of time versus a chronic. Acute, for example, pneumonia, you have any, any bacteria uh, running in your blood. And chronic will be, for example, tuberculosis, tuberculosis that lasts for a long period of time. So that is, you're going to see monocyte elevation in chronic infections and acute infections, you have the neutrophils elevated, elevated. If you have both elevated, so you, you have an acute infection, but actually is that infection is being repeated and repeated many years, many months, many years, and that is going to increase the monocyte as well. Then we have the eosinophils. The eosinophils are called the, the how you call when how you call when you the the sniper, right? The sniper. This is the snipers of the white cells. So we have eosinophil here, the nucleus of eosinophil, and you have a lot of granules here. Here's the bacteria, and what it's doing is this eosinophil is going to release these enzymes and to kill this bacteria or virus or whatever foreign body. These eosinophils are going to basically are going to be the snipers and are going to be elevated when you have allergies allergies when you have parasites parasites see how much is giving you the cbc are going to be the snipers are going to be the eosinophils that are going to be elevated when you have allergies or parasites then we have the basophils the basophils the basophils what they are going to basically are going to participate in the inflammatory inflammation process inflammation process why inflammation? Because they are going to release a very important substance that is called the histamine. The histamine. 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 Histamine is a pro-inflammatory. So this is the one who produces uh, inflammation. For example, you have pollen. You are allergic to the pollen. The pollen are going to go activate the basophils, and the basophils are going to produce histamine. Why do we need to produce histamine? Histamine are going to make the vessels like this at the beginning, they are going to vasodilate, vasodilate, vasodilation. That is what is going to cause the histamine. And this histamine, this histamine, <coughs> why is doing this vasodilation? Because it's going to bring more, more blood, more blood. Why is important to bring more blood? Because more blood are going to bring more white cells to fight the war, right? So that's why histamine is very important. Okay. In addition to that, when you have uh, histamine, you have allergies. Your nose is basically a running nose, and you have congestion. Why? Because when you have vasodilation, because of allergies, pollen, whatever, they are going to escape water. They are going to escape water. When it's vasodilated, dilated, the permeability, the passage of water is going to be easier coming out from the from the vasodilate vessels. These water are going to accumulate in the mucus of your nose and it's going to close the airway, and that is called congestion. Okay? What is this? Okay. Okay. All right, so, and the lymphocytes are going to be talked in the next class. Okay, so lymphocytes are basically the third line of defense that we are not going to talk about right now. All right, so the platelets are going to be essential for coagulation process. And that is called the hemostasis, hemos, hemostasia, hemostasia or hemostasia, hemostasis, hemostasia. This is all called hemostasis, right? So hemostasis means I didn't say homeostasis, huh? I hate I said hemostasia. Hemos, homeostasis is the internal balance. Nothing to do with this. This is hemostasia. That is different. You okay with that? All right, so for this, I'm going to make a, a summary here because we are running out of time. All right, so what time is it, please? Two seven. Can you give me 10 more minutes, please? Okay. Please, okay, thank you. Okay.
Okay, my God. Okay, so here we have we are going to talk about the hemostasia. The hemostasia are going to be that means the production of a clot. Clot. Clot is the same to say thrombus. Okay, what is a clot of thrombus? Thrombi is the single, the plural. Thrombi. Thrombi is plural. Thrombus is singular. What is a clot? A clot is composed by red blood cells plus platelets plus coagulation factors. That is the fibrin. The coagulation factors, just to mention here, the coagulation factors are going to be produced by the liver. This is the liver. So these proteins are going to have 12 proteins. We have protein 12, protein 11, protein 10, protein 9, protein, et cetera, et cetera. Protein 3 turns into protein 2, and they are going to do a protein 1 that is the fibrin at the end. Is the fibrin. So this coagulation factor, each of these is a coagulation factor. Each of these are going to be transformed by a chemical reaction in 12 to 11, 11 to 10, 10 to 9, 9 to, 9 to 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. So if some of these are failing, some of these are failing, you cannot produce the fibrin. If you don't have fibrin, you cannot produce clot. So what you're going to have is bleeding. You start bleeding. And that's happening when the liver is, work, is, is not working, or one of the factors are going to be of, uh, not present. For example, hemophilia, that we talk in bioscience. Another thing I want you to remember about the coagulation factors is that they are going to use vitamin K. Vitamin K. Vitamin K, we talk in bioscience, is a coenzyme. 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 What is a coenzyme? Coenzyme is going to help the enzymes help the enzymes are helpers of the enzyme. What is the en what is an enzyme? Enzyme is an accelerator of the chemical reaction. If you don't have vitamin K, the chemical reactions that are going to need to, in order to form fibrin are going to be absent. So you have low fibrin and you have risk for bleeding. Okay? All right. So that are the coagulation factors. Now, the platelets. The platelets all right, so let's start. So let's suppose that you're, you're, this is your room and you are you have platelets, you have a group of friends called platelets, another group of friends called red blood cells, okay? And another group of friends called fibrin. So we have in your room, your room is a vessel, an artery, right? So you have friends that are red blood cells, a group of friends, a group of friends uh, are going to be platelets and another group of friends in that room where you are, the vessel, are going to be the fibrin. So let's open the door. Let's open the door of your room. That represents the broken vessel. The broken vessel, what is going to allow is to escape blood. So all your friends, the blood are going to start going out of the room. So that is bleeding. So what is happening now? So red blood cells is happening, escaping, and that, the second step is going to be the platelets. What are doing the platelets? The platelets that are in your room, what well, they are going to see, oh, there is bleeding. So what they are going to do is to hack each other. They are going to hack, okay, let's hack each other and try to block the, the exit of the blood. So in order to prevent the bleeding. That actually is called the primary hemostasia. Primary hemostasia, because it's the first thing that happened, hemostasia. They are going to create what we call a platelet plaque. Platelet plaque. And this hugging, the hugging, I will put here the hugging, is called the aggregation. Aggregation. They are going to aggregate, hugging each other, in order to prevent the bleeding. But this plug is very weak. It's weak plug. It's a weak plug. So by itself, it's not going to be able, it's going to diminish the blood, but it's not going to contend, and it's not going to stop the bleeding. So what is ha happening is coming the help. The help is the fibrin. The fibrin is called the secondary hemostasia. 
And this fibrin is a protein. It's a protein. And this protein is like wires, like this. Wires like this. Wires. So it's like this plug that is weak. It's a mass of, of, of platelets. It's like the cement. But the cement, in order to be strong, you need to put it wires. And these wires are the fibrin. And these actually form a clot that is strong. You okay with that? Yes. Okay. So now, the, pla <coughs> the platelets, <coughs> the, the, we are going to check some laboratory tests. And with this, we finish. The laboratory tests. We have the PT and we have the PTT. All called the APTT. PT is the prothrombin time. And PTT is the activate, activated thromboplastin time. You have a lab test of PT, and the PT is going to be about 15 seconds. About 15 seconds. What is happening in 15 seconds? The clot is going to be formed. When you measure the PTT or APTT, that is going to take about 30, 30 to 35 seconds. Seconds. This is seconds. I put seconds here. Seconds. All right? So that is the PTT. The PTT and the, uh, and the uh, APTT, PT and PTT, those are the laboratory tests that are going to check if you have problems with, the, uh, with bleeding. So now, PT is 15 seconds, 15 seconds. PTT or APTT, I said APTT, sorry, APTT, are going to be 35 to 30 to 30, 35 seconds. Who is longer? PTT, 30 to 35. PT, 15 seconds, just to remember. Now, the PT have another, another, another important uh, thing that we need to remember is what we call the INR, INR. The INR is going to be the international, international, international normalized uh, ratio for one. That is INR. What is INR? INR is going to use the PT. INR, we have the PT over PT. This PT on the top is the PT that is the laboratory test showing for the patient. For the patient. It's the laboratory test. And PT is from the laboratory standard. So you compare the PT of the patient with the PT of the, of the laboratory. Who, who write you, who write down first? The patient. Patient is first, just to remember. Patient is first on the top. And then after that is coming the lab. So they compare and the value should be between one to 1.5. Some people say 0 0.8 to 1.2. But for this class, I go into as about 1.5 to 1.5. So that is the normal value of the INR. If you have too much or too high, too high INR, that is going to cause bleeding. If you have less than one, that will use clots. Okay? Okay. All right, so. Okay. All right, so can you give me two sec uh, one more minute, please? Okay. Yeah. All right, so the clot, when it's traveling, when it's traveling, so the clot is being detached. And actually, what they're going to do is <clears throat> going, that clot that is traveling, or traveling clot, is called embolus. Embolus. For this, I want you to remember uh, uh, embryos. They can produce blockages of the vessel. 
For example, they can produce pulmonary embolism or can produce strokes. Uh, I'm going to explain another time. This is the last part I want to remember. So we have, we have remember the, red, uh, the clot is going to be red blood cell plus platelet plus a uh, fibrin. So please just remember the clot is three of them. If I have red blood cells and platelet only, that is not a clot. If I have red blood cells and fibrin, that is not a clot. If I have platelets and fibrin only, that is not a clot. All right? So you need to have to make, to be called a clot, you need to have three, three, three. Now, the platelets are going to diminish the aggregation when you give aspirin. Aspirin. So aspirin is going to basically uh, decrease the activity of the platelets. Aspirin. Decrease the activity of the platelets. And we have here, the, there is two components here. We have the cumadin. Or called the warfarin. Cumadin and warfarin are going to affect the fibrin. They are going to decrease the fibrin. The heparin, the same. The, the heparin is going to basically decrease the fibrin too, decrease the fibrin. So the secondary mustachia are going to be affected by heparin, coumadin, and warfarin. For this, I want you to remember, and that is the last thing, coumadin and warfarin. Keep the cow. I want you to keep the cow. Keep the cow. Remember that mnemonic. Keep the cow. What is keep the cow? Keptacao means CO, means kumadin. Kumadin is the same to say warfarin. Cow. The cow is kumadin and warfarin are the same. Okay, the same. What is doing, what is the action of the, of the cow, of the kumadin and warfarin? They are going to compete with the vitamin D, K. Compete with the vitamin K. And you already remember the vitamin K is a coenzyme that participate in the formation of the fibrin, right? So if they compete with the vitamin K, what happens? Less, less fibrin. So you make it what we call a blood thinner. They are going to produce uh, uh, the blood more, getting more thinner. And what is the laboratory test that we are going to use? Is the PT, PT or INR, PT or INR. So keep the cow, you're going to, you know that is going to basically uh, affect the the, uh, uh, the fibrin production by competing with the vitamin K and they are going to be checked the laboratory test with the PT or INR. INR. The heparin, the heparin, we are going to use the PTT or called the APTT. So that is basically the uh, what are the laboratory tests of, about this hemostasia. So, all right. All right, so, all right, so I know, I know, I know this was a very long class because of the, of the midterm. That's what happened in all these midterms. So I promise I'm going to do a very nice review on well, today is Wednesday, right? So Sunday. Let's do Sunday. I'm going to go over this material and I promise you're going to have all the applications that you can do at home. At this moment, I didn't have a chance, a time to do it. So it's 2.21. Probably it's one of the, it's the time that, it's the, this time was the largest time I took from you. So I'm sorry for that. And I thank you for your patience. Okay. All right, so just a few comments here, as, as always. So, uh, Christina, tell me your comment, please. How you? Were you going to talk about uh, LDL? The class or? today. The class today. Yeah, oh. be direct. Be the direct. I, 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 I. It was, it was a good um, class. More uh, applications, although um, I, it is going to take me a, a while to get onto the application part of it. <laughs> That's that's the new part that uh, we haven't seen, you know. 
That basically review from bioscience, right? Remember that? Except for the KPT and the cow and was that? Yeah, keep the cow. Yeah, keep the cow. You you look for a cow. Okay, very okay. good. Uh, please, Jojo, tell me your opinion about the lecture today. Uh, it was good. It was good. Yeah, just um, just a little a new information and um. Need to take more time to study. Yeah, I promise I'm going to do very much the a review for Sunday. I'm going to take two hours. Please attend that. Uh, basically, we talk all the topics that curriculum wants you to have, but I'm not satisfied myself seriously. So I want to give more, to give more examples. It was too fast for me, so I'm criticizing myself. You see, okay, so. Uh, but Sunday we are going to try to uh, go over again. Okay, I'm not going to do new material. It's going to be about this only. So I cover all the material you need for this lecture. What I'm going to do is to try to elaborate and make you try to memorize in easy way. Okay. All right, Gabby, can you tell me your opinion, please? Um. Yeah. Everything was reviewed except for the last part. Um, I think I just need clarification on the medication application of um, like the last part of it for like the clots, like um, applying the medication. So like the aspirin, the Coumadin, the, war the warfarin, and like how it affects a person. Okay. I just need more clarification on it. Okay, so we will do that on Sunday. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, Joey, are you there? Yeah. Your opinion, please. It was okay. I was um, some stuff were a little bit new since I didn't I can I didn't remember from bio science. So I guess the Sunday will make it more better and explain it. Okay. Okay. So let's 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 do. Uh, I telling you is about the, the time that we was taking for me time. I'm so sorry for that. So 10 to 2 is basically I have half of the time to do the whole the whole lecture. Okay, so what we are going to do again. So don't worry. I want, because I want to make you be solid in some concepts here. Anybody else want to make a comment, please? Because I know it's it's a little bit late. You want to do things. Is there a, is there a video on this? The, um, Christina, you Christina, you already talk. No, no, yeah, keep going, keep going. <laughs> the last part, is there like a video on that? The heparin and the comatin? And the... Yeah, this is actually in, in my YouTube channel, and mm -hmm. I'm going to um, post this video as soon as processed by the system. So, you know, I cannot post it right away because the system is processing I probably one hour, two hours, mm -hmm. something like that, okay? Yeah, I just make it a different, uh, an additional video. Like how you have a side video sometimes? Uh, yeah, you it's actually go to the final review of of anatomy physiology. So okay. you just you just uh, play and uh, and rewind or forward the video until you find it's, it's a sequence. I I do lecture one, two, three, four, five, six in, in that order. Okay. Or review the midterm. The midterm review is having that too. So I don't know if I put it in the midterm or the final, but okay. in either way, so you can find. It. Okay. Right. Okay. Any other question? All right. So Otis, uh, Chia, who just Dionisio, who just came, uh, I was telling the the class that there is two questions that are going to add uh, points because it was not really it was repeated one and the other one was two options, same options. So I'm going to give everybody four points. Doesn't matter if you have it right or wrong. Okay, we got it. All right. All right. So, if there is anything else, please thank you so much. I will see you Sunday. Again, thank if you have any question for whatever, just you can text me. You know, I'm very. I answer as fast as I can. Text sometimes is immediately. Or so communication is vital for me. Okay. So anything I can. Help you, let me know. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Joy. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.